48 hours before my big brother killed himself in the garage of our childhood home in Carmel, I was serving really delicious apple pie to my best friends in San Diego. This was a coup de gras pie, that rare Thanksgiving dessert that manages to match the glory of the unlucky bird that preceded it. The apples were tangy, the spices perfect, and the lattice, golden brown and glistening, would have been right at home on Martha Stewart's windowsill. This pie looked better than anything I had ever made. <laughs> and though I'd spent years fattening up these very people with bourbon chocolate cupcakes and hazelnut biscotti and pear torts, according to them, this pie also tasted better than anything I'd ever made. This level of praise would make any baker swell with pride. I can only hope that the baker of this particular pie felt his ears burning wherever he was, <laughs> probably gearing up for his Black Friday shift in the Southeast San Diego Costco bakery where I'd bought the pie <laughs> for $9.99. I hadn't intended to take credit for the Costco pie, really. It was an honest mistake that could happen to anyone who is a liar. Here's how it works. <laughs> First, you mumble, thank you, for a job well done by someone else. Then you do that again, and before you know it, you're explaining the finer points of crimping pie crust and ideal cinnamon to nutmeg ratio. Then someone mentions something about getting the recipe, and at that point, you'd better hope for an earthquake or a bear attack or some kind of god-awful unthinkable tragedy that forever derails any and all thoughts of apple pie recreation, which is where my brother's suicide comes in. I really dodged a bullet there, didn't I? I uh, dodged a bullet. It's the kind of usually innocuous figure of speech that becomes temporarily verboten after a suicide. Uh, also, I'd rather die, kill me now. Even hang in there, a benign phrase most commonly associated with a kitten poster tacked to an orthodontist ceiling was cause for a sputtering apology. Hang in there, oh God, what did I just say? In the days after Kent's death, as if the word hang might be enough to trigger a full-fledged breakdown. But for the most part, people said the right thing, just by saying something. The landline would ring, mom would take it to the back of the house to cry and talk privately. Then she'd report who said what, reminding my sister and me that one of Carmel's small town virtues was that people could be counted on to pick up the phone, drop by with a casserole or a Starbucks, or make a point of telling you they'd always remember your brother's radiant smile. With every visitor and every call, the ghosts of our family's past floated into our newly haunted house and we welcomed them. Then Terry Chaplin called. <clears throat> Here's what I know about Terry Chaplin. <laughs> Number one, about 25 years ago, Terry Chaplin wore a toga, angel wings, and an unsettling amount of glitter gel makeup to sing Johnny Angel in a karaoke contest to benefit local youth sports changing the words to Ronnie Angel in honor of her no doubt mortified husband, Ronald, who would not be her husband much longer. <laughs> For years, my family watched a VHS of this performance on special occasions, Christmases, birthdays, Tuesdays. <laughs> Number two, Terry Chaplin's misfit son, Russell, was in Kent's class. My brother and I once ran into Russell at a Black Crows concert where he shared his wheat with us. It was one of the only times Kent and I ever got high together. Only now that he's gone do I realize it was probably one of the greatest nights of my life. Number three. One week after my 36-year-old brother took his own life and a part of all of ours, Terry Chaplin called my mother and said, you know, they come home to kill themselves to punish their parents. In a soap opera, this comment gets met with a swift slap across the face <laughs> and an incredulous at-home audience. On the phone, in real life, it was almost too bizarre to cause offense. Compared to the heartfelt sentiments we were hearing from our mailman, grade school teachers, and our congressman, they come home to kill themselves to punish their parents was certainly an original way of reaching out. Mom relayed this message to us in a somewhat bemused, get a load of this crazy dummy kind of way. 
If Terry Chaplin had been someone we respected, someone we hadn't seen flub the remarkably simple lyrics to Johnny Angel in a low-budget Halloween costume, we would have been hurt. We would have been devastated. Because the only thing worse than the idea that Kent hadn't given any thought to his family in choosing this ending was the truly horrifying prospect that he had, and worse yet, <laughs> that we were less an obstruction to the act than a motivation. Still, even an idiot doesn't get to go through life thinking that's an okay thing to say out loud. Rehearsing the screed I would level at Terry Chaplin if I ever saw her again was the rare bright spot in an otherwise dismal week. Very Inigo Montoya. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kirsten Deck. You offended my family. Prepare to be on the receiving end of a scathing denunciation of your lack of common decency, as well as the asinine premise you share with my mother. <laughs> the morning of the service, we steeled ourselves as best we could with friends, Xanax, and each other, and we headed to the church. I heard my exhausted mom say more to herself than any of us, let's get this over with. After that, my memory of the service is spotty. I know my dress was too big. I know a shepherd in the church's life-size nativity scene wore a San Francisco Giants cap. I know that every time I looked up during my eulogy, I made eye contact with the family dentist, a dead ringer for Dan Aykroyd. I know I've never been so proud of my younger sister as when she stood up in front of the whole town and delivered a clear-eyed, composed remembrance of our brother. I know that one of Kent's oldest friends told me I looked like shit, which was true if not really necessary to share. <laughs> and I know that I was furious. Ever since the call announcing a world without my brother in it, I'd been seething with a white hot anger that bubbled up like lava at pretty much everything. People writing about Kent on Facebook, people not writing about Kent on Facebook, the morning sky refusing to turn permanently black and dump rain forever. Animals, babies, inanimate objects, Keith Richards, because how is that guy alive? <laughs> and my brother isn't. I was furious with my poor, sad parents and Kent's wife for not being able to foresee this or undo it. I was furious at Carmel for being so oppressively small. I was furious that I was swimming in a stupid dress and that I cared about it. Mostly, I was furious with Kent. He left without saying goodbye, ruined the holidays, and broken my parents' hearts. He'd robbed my daughters of an uncle. He'd forced me to choose between NPR and total silence in the car so I wouldn't be caught off guard by a song that made me think of them, which they all did. And he'd exposed our family for what we are, for what we all are, an imperfect, vulnerable collection of near strangers who think a lifetime of shared history is all the proof we'd ever need to back up a statement like, Kent would never do that. I was furious that he hadn't given me one last opportunity to try to convince him hmm. that life is absolutely worth living, that there is a place for him. <laughs> and that now and then, we all feel helpless and hopeless and lost and wished we were different people who traveled different roads. <clears throat> One last chance to tell him that I needed him and that I loved him. Uh, but as funerals go, the guest of honor wasn't at this party and would never hear another angry word from me or anyone else. It's generally considered poor form to take out all consuming rage on people you love when they're grieving someone they love. So in terms of punching bags, my family was out. And everywhere I turned, all I saw was kind faces, people asking how they could help and what they could do. And this was no good. Someone had to pay. <laughs> and then I thought, maybe no one does. Perhaps this would be the beginning of healing. I'd count to 10, do breathing exercises, channel my anger into positive energy. I'd learn to focus on good memories of Kent, playing Weezer on his guitar late at night, twirling me on an otherwise empty Cancun dance floor. Maybe I'd take up knitting again or learn how to meditate. 
I'd embrace myself and my family and Kent for our flaws and our limitations, and I would forgive. Then Terry Chaplin showed up. <laughs> so knitting could wait. So Terry Chaplin was hard to miss, not only because her look was equal parts Hocus Pocus, Bette Midler, and live action Dr. Seuss character, but because she charged right into me, totally oblivious to the buffer zone a family enjoys immediately after memorial service ends. I hugged Grandpa, hugged Uncle John, and then Terry Chaplin stood before me, like an antelope presenting itself to a wild dog. <laughs> I was maniacally grinning as she asked if I remembered her. I did. <laughs> Terry Chaplin! Yes, I know you. You're the woman who called my mother and told her that Kent came home to kill himself in order to punish her and my dad. That's what you said. What a really terrific thing to say to my mother. Poor, dumb, stunned Terry Chaplin. <laughs> she, she blinked a lot and started to explain herself. I think it's hard to say for sure because I was busy yelling, that's what you said, Terry, that's what you said. <laughs> Quickly, my husband led me away, probably aware that he'd be held partly responsible if his bereaved wife threw a punch in a church. Alone in the bathroom a moment later, I rehashed what I just shouted and realized <laughs> I hadn't shouted much. It was shocking how quickly I'd run out of things to yell at Terry Chaplin. A direct recitation of her faux pas? Some mild sarcasm? Is that all there is? It was not exactly the epic takedown I'd envisioned. But later that afternoon, I heard my grandma's supposed eyewitness account of this episode. To her colorful recollection, I called Terry a fucking bitch. <laughs> uh, this was a big deal to my grandma, whose response to seeing the Book of Mormon was to launch a campaign against profanity. Anyway, unless I had a blackout, real possibility considering the pharmacy's worth of other people's drugs coursing through my system that afternoon, <laughs> this didn't happen though it's a lot more exciting and a hell of a lot more satisfying to pretend it did. So when I overheard Grandma proudly telling her version of events, claiming a victory I craved but definitely didn't deserve, I let it slide. What good would it do to correct her? She clearly preferred her rendition. I did too. And really, what's the harm in a wishful embellishment here and there? Where's the lasting damage in a little white lie that makes you look and feel like the person you'd like to be or the person you'd like others to think you are? Even if it's just for a little while before you come clean and say, hey, this is me. I love you. I really need to tell you something about that Thanksgiving pie. Thanks. Vamp first timer, Kirsten Deck.